All right, Scott. So uh, I I, um, I know you're working on a couple of interesting things that we're going to be seeing at the Super Bowl, uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention how do you think things played out this year for the Cowboys and what do you think about next year? Are they going to be in the Super Bowl next year? Well, I thought they actually had a chance to be in the Super Bowl this year, Ed. Uh, you know, you try to always be as positive as you can, but with that comes the the fact that the team has to be as productive as they as they should be. And unfortunately, I don't think that was the case during the, the better part. Well, I shouldn't say the better part of the year. I thought the uh, the defense really played uh, some uh, some stellar football at times this year. And the offense did, too. A couple of games ago, I thought, uh, you know, from Dak right on down, I thought, well, maybe this is the year. Maybe they could go. But, uh, you know, what what happened against the 49ers was just really very disappointing and just uh, – I don't want to say unacceptable, but it, it just was it was just not what I thought it would be. And I'm, I'm sure the players uh, felt much the same and would like to have had that opportunity to to do it again and do it a little better. Or, or you know, I, I was mentioning to some people, I think what we forget is how good the uh, the San Francisco defense is. I mean, they mm-hmm. they're, they're the number one defense in the league, I believe. Now, last week didn't work out as well for them. Against um, the, the Eagles, it was a different story. It was a different story, and it's interesting because the Cowboys and the Eagles were very competitive, but um, the defense could not hold up against uh, against the Eagles. Yeah, no question about that. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the Super Bowl when you get a, a team like Philadelphia that has not been uh, there that many times. And and so uh, it's uh, it's it's going to be interesting. It'll be uh, it's good to see. As a matter of fact, uh, I do a a radio show with a couple of women that. Uh, I, I call them girls, but they're they're past that stage. They're uh, young ladies, uh, been around for a while. One is Marjorie Herrera Lewis, and for people that uh, have been Cowboys fans for any appreciable period of time, Ed, dating all the way back to the '80s when Tom Landry was the head coach of the team, the legendary coach of the Cowboys, their first 29 years. Uh, she was one of the first women on the sideline, and she uh, she covered the Cowboys. And Coach Landry thought she was just great. We didn't have uh, a lot of women until the, the end of the 70s, into the 80s, uh, covering sports. So it was uh, it was really something to see what Marjorie did. And, and like I said, she had a great relationship with Coach. And uh, so she went from the Star-Telegram and then ended up at the Dallas Morning News, Star-Telegram in Fort Worth. But then you've got, uh, the, she's one of the people, and then you've, the other one we've got is, uh, is, uh, is, is a gal named uh, Marnie. And uh, she, her grandfather, uh, Leonard Tose, the, uh, former owner of the um, Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, back in the days of, uh, say, Dick Vermeil when he was a coach and what have you. Um, but back in the 70s into the 80s, uh, that's his granddaughter. So Marnie's just a great gal and uh, very astute as to what goes on in the football world. But that was her grandfather. And her mother became the first, as a matter of fact, the only to this day, the only female general manager in the history of the National Football League, so she has a lot of a uh, lot of history of uh, NFL football in her in her blood, and so uh, but she's great. So the three of us do this show called Journey Through Sports and Life, and we talk about nothing but uh, sports, uh, the owners, the players, the Hall of Famers, the Pro Bowlers, the the you know the World Series recipients, uh, the Olympics, whatever it might be who they are, what they're all about, where they've come from, what legacy they left behind. And uh, it's it's a lot of fun, but it goes to hundreds of uh, stations across the country every Saturday morning at 10. So they have asked us to be on Radio Row at the uh, at the Super Bowl. So we are most honored to be a part of that. So we'll be doing that out there as well. So it's going to be a busy time. Uh, obviously, Radio Row speaks for itself, but how, how did they, what's the history of the Radio Row? Well, I, I can't tell you how many years ago it started. Uh, I remember, uh, gosh, back in the day when I was still a sports anchor for the NBC affiliate here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, NBC5. Um, I remember being on Radio Row as a guest at that time, and uh, especially when the Cowboys were in town. Uh, they, the different uh, you know, hosts of the show would, would grab us. They might be from a different city, or maybe they were from the opposing, opposing team city. Um, and it was a lot of fun just to talk football and talk about being in a in a different city and uh, and what light ahead. And, you know, gosh, I've I covered uh, 30 Super Bowls as a broadcaster. And then I was asked to uh, to um, uh, be the master of ceremonies uh, 
with the at the taste of the NFL, which was the big fundraiser the eve of the Super Bowl, and there were always five to six thousand people at that. It was for the 32 food food banks in the NFL in the uh, the uh, food banks in the 32 NFL cities, and that was always a lot of fun. And uh, a lot of nationally known chefs were there, and there was a different chef for each city that would be there representing that particular city. And then there was a usually a Hall of Fame uh, football player from that particular city. So you had 32 great chefs, 32 uh, great football players, and uh, and also there was uh, Miss America. So I'd always be up there on the stage uh, with Miss America. So it was kind of a kick uh, meeting a new Miss America every year and, and, and hosting that. And as a matter of fact, uh, they asked me to write a book uh, on the history of, uh, they had seen the first book I'd written on uh, whatever it takes, life lessons learned through sports legends. And so I, uh, I said, sure, I'd be happy to. So I wrote a book called uh, Bring Out the Best. And it has everybody from the, the Gallo wine family to all the chefs, to all the, to all the uh, uh, players that would come over the years and represent their specific teams. So it was a lot of fun, but it was for such a great cause. And so I very much enjoyed doing that. Did that catapult your 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 leadership? Uh, you know, you obviously the book, but your career in, in leadership after? Not not really. Um, I I always you know even when I was a broadcaster, I did a lot of uh, just always did a lot of uh, nonprofit, uh, whether it was emceeing or speaking, uh -huh. and uh, just people, especially nowadays, uh, I, I I certainly zero in on the fact that people are not kind, courteous, and respectful to one another anymore. It's, uh, it's really kind of sad. So my, my Leadership America is all about creating champions of change through a culture of civility. And how do you get there? And it was all C words, through courage, commitment, character, compassion, and not confrontation, but simple conversation. And uh, you know, credibility, continuity, creativity, consistency, and it all allows you to be confident and be that champion that you hope to be. And uh, so I, uh, I was in seventh or uh, second grade, seven years old, and my best friend died of leukemia. We'd gone trick or treating, and then I came back home, and my mother had these two Maxwell House coffee jars, the, the the cans, and she had this little piece of tape wrapped around it with a paper, and it said U N I C E F. And you know, Benji and I said, "What is that?" He said, "Well, that stands for UNICEF." Well, now that you've gone out and had a good time and gotten your uh, goodies for Halloween this year, now you get a chance to help somebody else. So that's when she explained, she sat us both down and explained what philanthropy was and what it meant to be a difference maker. So uh, so I, I kind of had that, you know, from an early age uh, with both my parents, uh, giving back, making a difference in the lives of those that need it most. That's what it was all about. And as a matter of fact, I created from all that my share, parents shared with me, I said, uh, live your life as a go-getter, but share your life as a go-giver. And and that's uh, that all came from, from my parents. So... Wow. Uh, so, well, I, that's very prevalent in the NFL, obviously. I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of the players get actively involved in the community. But, you know, I never thought about this. The Your perspective, uh, being a broadcaster and meeting and interviewing all these players, your perspective on leadership has got to be really unique because you've seen, you know, from Roger Staubach to, you know, Micah Parsons. I mean, it's just, you know, the leadership aspect of sports and then taking that into the real world must have really been helpful. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned Roger Staubach, Ed. Uh, if I had to, to pick one, one player, and it, this is awful tough to do because I have great respect for a lot of players. Uh, you think of somebody like a Chad Hennings who went to not the Naval Academy like Roger Staubach did, but to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. And then had before he, before he, came in, he had to serve his five years in the service. And before he came to the Cowboys in 1989, 1990, before the Cowboys won their three Super Bowls in four years, before anybody ever heard of a Tom Brady, um, you know, here's this guy named Chad Hennings, 45 missions in an A A15. I mean, you know, just unbelievable. I mean, you know, this guy in the Persian Gulf War. And, uh, but that was that was you know so that's what I say. There's so many people that I, I've met along the way that I just have such incredible respect for, in all sports. Um, but uh, if I had had to pick one, if I was forced to pick one, uh, I remember meeting Jesse Owens, who my mother had told me about. She was born in Alabama, and uh, uh, you know it was it was a tough tough scenario to be a a, a black and African American growing up. At the turn of the century, he was born in 1912, 1913, 
And uh, it just, uh, it was tough. And he had some asthma problems and ended up going to Ohio to, uh, to live with his grandmother. And uh, when he was in Ohio, he not only was an academically great student, but athletic, we all know what he, he came to be. And uh, he set all kinds of national records while he was in high school at this, at this school in, in, o or in Ohio. And so I ended up going to Ohio State, not on an athletic scholarship, but on an academic scholarship. And then was asked to go to the Olympics in Berlin in 1936. And uh, it was incredible. And my first book that my mother told me, this is, you ought to read this book. It was the history it was a, you know, of, of, uh, uh, of Jesse Owens. And that's when I was in, you know, probably seven, eight years old. She told me every summer during summer vacation, when we were at the cottage, I had to read a book. You didn't just blow off doing schoolwork during the summer. You had to still stay focused. And so that was the first book I ever read. So to meet him all those years later, what happened is he went off to the Olympics. I'll tell you a quick story here. He went off to the Olympics in 36, won four gold medals, the first American to ever do that. And because uh, Hitler was just coming into office, Hitler was on his podium or whatever you wish to call it, looking over the 80,000 people at Berlin Stadium in Germany. And it came time for Jesse to get his, uh, his medals and it wasn't gonna happen because Hitler didn't like minorities, didn't like Jews, didn't like blacks, didn't like just about anybody except Germans, I guess, but he would not give him his medals. And so picture an athlete today not getting his medals at the Olympics. I mean, you'd certainly hear about it. Jesse, being the most dignified fellow you're ever gonna meet, just never said a thing and left and came back to the United States without his medals. And he didn't have them for, for years. 1951, 15 years later, the Harlem Globetrotters gave him a call and said, Jesse, did you ever get your medals? No. Well, you need to be, uh, you know, taken back to Germany. You need to join us. We're going to make a trip over there and we're going to be playing a game over there in front of 80,000 in the very stadium that you, you know, you won your four gold medals. He said, oh my gosh, you're kidding. He said, yeah, would you like to go? Yeah. Well, don't tell anybody. We're going to surprise them. So the trotters take off and they get over there and then they land in a helicopter right in the center of the, the field there at the Berlin Stadium. Here's all these Germans. So this is 1951. This is after World War II. And, you know, they don't know what to, what to expect. Well, they get a great round of applause from the, all the Germans there. And then the announcer says, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for that great round of applause for the visiting United States Harlem Globetrotters traveling around the world, sharing their great talent of basketball. But they also brought with them a surprise guest. It's someone we all know. And if you were here 15 years ago, you saw this man on this very field become the first American in the history of the Olympic Games to win four gold medals. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Olympic champion Jesse Owens. Well, out of the helicopter he comes, the people get on their feet and they stood like that for 15 minutes. Well, he went all the way around the stadium. And then the trotters played their game and did their thing. And Jesse sat there and watched it. And he was, he was up in a little area where the podium was, where the announcer and everything was. At the end of the game, trotters are all back up there. They all sit down and they, you know, had entertained and everybody loved it. And Conrad Adenauer, who was the chancellor of Germany at the town, time, said, well, what would you all think of the trotters? And everything? Yeah, big round of applause. And he said, how about our special guest here? Jesse Owens. And he turned to Jesse and he said, Jesse, this has just been a real treat for us all to be able to say congratulations to you for what you did here on this very field 15 years ago. I want you to know, though, 15 years ago, the dictator of this company or this country didn't even extend one hand of congratulations to you. I want to say to you, eye to eye, face to face, man to man, as the chancellor of this great country, Germany, and all these 80,000 people in the entire country of Germany, we extend two hands of congratulations to you, a true champion. And they applauded for another five minutes. And, and then I got to meet Jesse Owens. Um, I, I, you know, I was just a punk kid out of college and I just started in, as a broadcaster. And I was asked to MC this, uh, this, it was a commencement exercise at a, at a school or something. So I said, sure. And they said, we've got Jesse Owens coming here to be the speaker. And I said, oh, you're kidding me. I remember reading his book as a kid. Oh, I called my folks and I told, I told my mother and, I, you know, they all, oh, you're kidding. 
So I got some some film. That's back in the film day, just before videotape came about. Got some film and got some, you know, from the, the games and everything so I could use this on TV. I thought I'll interview him and he can talk about the 36 games. Long story short, we did that. It was incredible. And I really enjoyed it. And he could not have been nicer. Oh, I was so impressed. Called my parents and told my mother, boy, you were right. He's a gentleman. What a great, just an incredible individual. Well, that was it. But six, eight months later, I get a call to be an MC again. And I said, uh, who's that? Who's speaking? They said, ah, uh, we're not sure. Well, I get to the school where I'm going, this uh, commencement exercise. And all of a sudden, I hear this guy as I'm walking across the parking lot. Hey, it's Scott, isn't it, Scott? And I look over and I said, uh, yeah, how, how are you? I couldn't see who it was. I didn't have my glasses on. I looked over and he said, Scott, it's Jesse. And I said, oh, my gosh, Mr. Owens. No, 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 Scott, it's Jesse. We're friends. Remember, we you call me Jesse. And so we went in and we exchanged exchanged uh, addresses after that. And I sent him a note after that and said how you know honored I was to be. I got a note back from him, and I even got a note from his wife when he passed away and how special my relationship was with him in his later years. I mean, my gosh, Jesse Owens, hello. Uh, so, so Jesse Owens, to answer your question, and I didn't mean to go so long on that whole thing, but uh, Roger Staubach would be the other. And I've met Roger and Marianne and their five kids, and I've seen what an iconic individual he is, great legendary ball player. One of only 10 to win a Heisman Trophy and then go on to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But just what he is as an individual. And that, to me, is what's most important. I remember my dad used to tell me, you know, it's, it's the people. He liked Lou Gehrig. I remember taking my dad to uh, Yankee Stadium and showing him where Lou Gehrig was and the plaque and the whole thing. And, oh, gee, he was like a kid in the candy store. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's really what it was about. I, I created the Jason Witten Collegiate Man of the Year Award back in 2017. And the reason I did that is because in the NFL, there's an a Walter Payton man of the year, but in pro foot or in the collegiate ranks, there is not. And I've emceed the, the uh, Doak Walker national running back award that's given to the top collegiate running back since it started in 1990. In a couple of years prior to that, I, I, I began doing the Davey O'Brien national quarterback award that goes in, in uh, honor of Davey O'Brien, who was the fourth Heisman winner back in 1938, led TCU to its only national championship. And, and it just, uh, it's been a lot of fun, but I saw in, in you know, it, he just was, uh, Witten was just one of these people that was just a great player on the field, but he was a, a good guy off the field as well. And he, and, and just, and he makes a difference. He, he came from an abused family and uh, has helped uh, kids, boys and girls clubs. We've done some different events over there, but the whole idea is, is he's a great, has great integrity and great leadership skills on the field, but he lives that life off the field as well. And that's that's what it's all about. And, and yeah, that's I mean, what life should be all about. It's unbelievable. The experience you've had with leadership through through all these people, you got to put Jesse Owens. I mean, that story's, that, that's, that's at the top of the list. And then um, Dak Prescott won the uh, Walter Payton Man of the Year Award this year. Right, right, yeah. right. So uh, exactly. and they're they're all Texans and they all live in Dallas. But Scott, <laughs> here's the here's the thing that amazes me about you: your memory is insanely accurate. How, how how do you do that? You remember years and dates and names and it's it's funny you say that, Ed, because sometimes I'll forget it. I'll forget a name. I'll say, oh, who was that? That was uh, you know. And then you, oh yeah, well that's who it was, or that's. Uh, but I can remember numbers. I remember numbers from, I remember the day I got engaged for Pete's sake. I remember when my kids were, um, you know, uh, born. I remember when they started the school. I remember what, when they graduated. I remember, and, and statistics. Uh, I when know. I used to be on the air, I would remember the statistics of, of this guy did this, or this guy did that. Um, yeah. You know, and, and dates too. When was the, when was the ice bowl? December 31st, 19, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, 68, um, you know, uh, the uh, uh, December 28th, 1975, the Hail Mary, Roger Staubach to Drew Pearson. Where was it? Up in Minnesota. You know, it, it just, I, I just, I don't know why. I just uh, remember all those things, those dates and things. So it's kind of crazy, but. Uh, <laughs> it's a skill. It's a skill you can't teach. 
Well. And uh, I just, I really enjoy it when I listen to you because not only are your stories interesting and amazing, but the detail and the dates and the, the times, <laughs> it was like, I remember it was at two o'clock on a Tuesday and, you know. <laughs> well, I hope I don't bore you to death with it. It'd take forever to tell you with all those, all those dates and all those stories and all those whatever. Oh, that's, that's great. Okay, so this leads me to your next masterpiece, which I'm really uh, looking forward to seeing. Um, and this is the Perfect Ten, which is airing on Fox uh, right. th before the Super Bowl. Um, before we get into it, though, I want to ask you, like, how did it come about? How did this idea come about? Well, a friend of mine, uh, his name's Lee. Lee uh, was going up. Matter of fact, I was supposed to go up and I had to have rotator cuff surgery at the same time. But back uh, 2016, uh, uh, 2017, uh, 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 Tim Brown, Tim Brown, the outstanding Heisman. Heisman winner, Heisman Trophy winner, and of course, Pro Football Hall of Fame, went to Notre Dame. As a matter of fact, he is the only wide receiver of all, all the uh, Heisman Trophy winners that's a wide receiver. It's usually sure. a running back or a quarterback. Sure. Yeah, quarterbacks, and but it's mostly running backs and uh, uh, that have won, that have won, that are a member of this elite group of, so uh, in-, in uh, What year did he graduate? Uh, uh, gotcha. 1987. Ah. And I'll tell you something, too. I can't here's, stump you. <laughs> well, here's a little <laughs> trivia for you. You'll like this one, Ed. Name the only, only two players to ever win the Heisman Trophy and graduate from the same public high school in America. Oh, wow. I don't know. Is it? Oh, wait. Is it Drew Brees? Is it Westlake in Texas? No. Well, no, that, that's not bad. That's not because Westlake is a great. Uh, yeah, yeah, they've, they've got a lot of quarterbacks coming out of Westlake. Absolutely. I don't know. What is it? Dallas, Texas. Really? Woodrow Wilson High School. Tim Brown, 1987, recipient okay. of the and the only wide receiver to ever win the Heisman Trophy. Wow. The only wide receiver. And guess who the other guy was? Somebody I mentioned just a moment ago. Oh, boy. 1930. That, that shows you how good my memory is. <laughs> 1938, the fourth Heisman Trophy winner, Davey O'Brien. Davey went to Woodrow Wilson High School before he went then from Dallas to Fort Worth to go to TCU. Wow. Yep. So uh, interesting. Yeah. So uh, and I'm trying to remember. What, so what was your question? So remember, no, I, so I want to get into I want to get into the perfect ten because oh. it's really interesting. Right, ten players who were Heisman Trophy winners yeah. who had made the Hall of Fame, which is is an interesting story in itself, but. How did it come about? How did the idea come about? Yeah, it was it was uh, my friend Lee, and he was going up, and he was with Tim Brown, and Tim was about to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Well, they were both up in Canton, Ohio. That's where it takes place every year in August, and so consequently, they're they're up there, they're having a good time, and just just as they got to the stadium to to go through the ceremony, Lee turned to, to uh, Tim and said, "Hey, let me ask you a question. I got to thinking." You won the Heisman Trophy. Here you are about, about to go into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, but you won the Heisman Trophy. How many players ever did that, too, that are a part of that group? And Tim said, God, I never thought of that. Gosh, that's something. I have no idea. So the two of them looked it up after, did a little research after they came back to, to, to uh, Texas, and, and they found there were, there were uh, nine of them at the time. Nine of them at the time. There's been a tenth one since. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Charles Woodson. Charles Woodson uh, was, uh, now there's one for you too. Charles Woodson is the only defensive player to ever win the Heisman. Heisman started in 1935. Uh, yeah, 35, yep, 1935. Huh? And, and uh, um, I think it was uh, Berwanger was the, the guy that won it. And uh, 1935, wow. and now all these years later, Here's, I mean, we're pushing what? That's 85 years ago or, you know, um, that's amazing. Over 85 years ago. And wow. uh, so he's the only defensive player. And Charles went in in 2021. So, uh, but at the time there were nine. And so uh, they came back and they couldn't believe it. Doak Walker, 19, uh, 1948. He was the 14th Heisman winner, 1948 out of SMU. And of course the Cotton Bowl, the yeah. historic Cotton Bowl, the house that Doak built. And the reason that SMU played their games there is so they could get more people. And then, then they expanded it so that more people could see this incredible ball player. Uh, I, have a, I have a great picture. My son was met, I, 
uh, you know, with all my years of uh, emceeing the uh, the Doak Walker, uh, I met Doak, and he was he almost be he, he was almost like a third grandfather for my son. My my son just idolized him, and uh, and he was so kind and so just just a perfect gentleman, one of the nicest athletes of that era that I ever met, and so uh, um, he was just taken back, my son was, by this guy that was so, just so great, but so, and he saw the covers that he was on like 46, 47 covers of magazines from, you know, the Saturday Evening Post and Look and Life and all that, but Sports Illustrated and came out, what, in 1953, 54, and, you know, who was on the cover? You know, it, it's it's crazy. Yeah. So, uh, but all these years later, here's, here's a Doak, and so my son got the rights through his family after he passed away to take all the black and white pictures that were taken of him um, and and uh, colorize them. So he did. And one of my favorites is, a, I wish I had one here, but I, I don't have one here. But uh, um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a colorized picture. It's a great, great shot. And it's dope going up for a pass. And there's a guy right over here. Now you see that it's not black and white. It's white and orange. So you think, oh, look at it. Got, it's a guy from UT. How about that? Somebody wow. from Texas. And he's up there about to catch the pass. And this guy's, you know, going to come in and try and tackle him. Yeah. Tackle him. Number 24. You know who it was? A guy that had just finished up as a member of the military in World War II. Went on to become the legendary Tom Landry. Oh, wow. How about that? Playing in the How same game at the Cotton Bowl in 1948, wow. the year that Doak won the Heisman. So enough on that. So you got Doak Lots Walker. Lots of history. Okay, so let's. Uh, what are we going to see on Fox? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you the players that are involved. Doak Walker in 48, Paul Hornig in 56. Paul was a quarterback at uh, at uh, Notre Dame, but when he came into the NFL, the Green Bay Packers, Vince Lombardi, they already had a guy named Bart Starr. He was the quarterback. So Paul Hornig became a running back along with Jim Taylor. Wow. So uh, that, that's how that, it worked back then, right? I'm sorry. That's how it worked back then. You, <laughs> right. Utility players. You got both it. Sides, you name it. Punting. <laughs> Offense, defense, special teams, whatever. I remember George Blanda. Was he the quarterback and the punter? Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Donnie Anderson, who's going to be honored this year as the recipient of the Legends Award for the Doak Walker. Great running back for the Green Bay Packers. In the late, he was in uh, Super Bowls one and two. Played in the Ice Bowl against the Cowboys. And uh, he's going to be receiving the Legends Award of the Doak Walker. He was a punter. He was a, you know, and as a matter of yeah. fact, he was the first one that, this is way off the, way off the know, This is interesting, but though. He, he kicks the ball. He tried to kick the ball so high, he was the one that kind of created the term hang time when it you did. talk about punt because he wanted the ball to go so high, even though it didn't go as far as, you know, you'd like to, he, he'd get it up high and, they never got a return, or very rarely, because holy cow, where's the ball? It's coming, it's coming down, it's coming down. Yeah, so that that was started by Donnie Anderson. But uh, okay, but, yeah. so let's go down so, to ten again. Yep. Yeah, so so you got uh, Doak Walker and uh, and uh, um, Paul Hornig, and then in '63 Naval Academy Roger Staubach, right. and then in '68 you've got O.J. Simpson, but unfortunately because of the issues that. OJ is head after he retired and after, you know, we all know what went on. Um, he's he has to be mentioned in this, but he's not part of the conversations that we that we had. Uh, then you go to <clears throat> 76. You've got uh, Tony Dorsett. 77. You've got Earl Campbell. 81. You've got uh, Marcus Allen. 87. Tim Brown. I mentioned that uh, Barry Sanders out of Oklahoma State in 88. And then from 88, Barry Sanders to just a couple of years ago. Charles Woodson in 2021. So you had a, a span of over 30 years. There was not a Heisman Trophy winner that on, went on to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Now in the 70s, you had all those players, 70s, early 80s. In the 80s, you had uh, three players. In the 70s, you had, uh, yeah, you had three players in the 70s too. And well, three look, of them, and it, may, it may not get any better going forward. I mean, the no, last bunch no. of Heismans, you know, I don't think many of them are going to make the Hall of Fame. No, I, I yep, would agree with you, would agree with you. So it's a, uh, um, and uh, you say, what about no Charles Woodson? Um, he was he was the winner, uh, and when the year he won, you know who was number two? A guy named Peyton Manning. That's why Peyton's not a member of this group. People say, where's Peyton Manning, Scott? 
missed out, finished second in the in the Heisman balloting to uh, Charles Woodson. Wow. So, yeah, I think right. that was the same year. I think that was the year, if uh, memory serves me right. Uh, but but yeah, it just uh, but it's it's an it's an incredible group. And before Thanksgiving, we had uh, the seven players, not OJ, but the the two deceased. We're talking about uh, Paul Hornig and, and uh, Doak Walker. But then we had uh, uh, and their families have become very involved in this whole, you know. But we had the seven players. They were in a room for four hours, and there was no interviewer. And NFL Films came in and shot this as they do so well and what they do. And it was just, it was above and beyond. And just to watch them and listen to them and just, just the, oh gosh, the, the, the connection that they all had was a, just, is like nothing you've ever seen. So uh, uh, we, uh, there were six of us in this group that put this all together, Lee and Tim Brown, because of course that's where I said a minute ago, that's where it came from. And then an attorney friend of ours, and then uh, a producer friend of ours uh, does movies and what have you uh, with with our group uh, with Murray Media. And so we knew him. So we needed somebody to kind of watch what we needed to be doing. And then my son and I, you know, I um, my son uh, graduated from Baylor University with a degree in television film. So when he graduated, he said, Dad, you ought to, you know, call it quits. You've been doing this TV thing for, you know, three decades. Why don't you uh, why don't you, you know, we start our own television production company. And so uh, that's what we did. He said, you're emceeing all these events, hundreds a, a year and doing different speaking. So we, we created that. So we are the six of this uh, of this group and uh, very proud to be a part of it. Uh, and uh, so we're going to have a big celebration. Uh, Fox, not Fox Sports or Fox News, but Fox, the, the main network, has bought the rights to this. And so they will be uh, they will be airing it at seven o'clock central time uh, on the eve of Super Bowl 57. So uh, give you a little plug for 7-Eleven, that's easy to make it, to remember it. It's on the, the, the 11th day of February, the night before the Super Bowl, and it's seven o'clock, Dallas-Fort Worth Central Time. So uh, if you're in another, you figure it out from there. I can't wait to see it. I can't imagine how you take the four hours and break it down to 30 minutes or however long the program it's, it's, is. It's gonna be Nothing an hour and a half. It's 90 minutes. The okay. four hours broken down to 90 minutes. Oh, okay, good. So Still probably, probably yeah, a little, lot of good stuff that didn't make it, right? Oh, yeah. There sure will um, be. So where, before we part ways here, where where do you put this on on uh, on a lot of the work that you've done in your career? You've got to be proud of this piece. Where, where do you put this in your... Um, well, I guess... You know, that's a great question, Ed. I, I, I'd probably have to say it's it's certainly in the top 10. The perfect 10 makes the top 10, um, but it'd probably be in the top five. Um, I've been very fortunate to have covered a lot of things. I was just a, a punk kid in 1980 when I was just starting into broadcasting out of, out of school, and uh, I got a chance to go to Lake Placid, New York. You remember what happened in Lake Placid, New York in February of 1980? Well, it was the, uh, the, the um, Olympics. Um, the Olympics. Yeah, and we don't want. I want to edit that part out because I knew that answer. <laughs> you remember what it was though? That was the remember. Man, they made a movie out of it. Remember, Mike Ruzioni scored the winning goal, and the Americans. Are you kidding me? I was uh, yeah, thirteen years old. Yeah, twelve years old. Yeah, I remember. I was, was living it. in New York at the time. Yeah, that was it. And and the they beat the Russians to win the Olympic uh, oh, gold, uh, four to three. Yeah, and uh, you know. It was actually it was a Friday night. Then they came back and had to beat Sweden on Sunday afternoon. Then you have to remember the day of the week, don't you? Yeah, you know, that was five o'clock is when the faceoff was at the at the high school in Lake Placid. That's where the game was played. Oh, it was unreal. But I was like a little kid in the candy store. But that that would have to be in the top five. This you know this perfect ten will be in the top five. Um, being uh, I was at the my first Super Bowl um, uh, was I, this was before I was in the in the business. But I saw the Dallas Cowboys as a kid uh, with my dad, went to my first Super Bowl, Super Bowl 12. And I was just a, a little punk kid with, you know, my dad. And we saw the Dallas Cowboys. And Roger Staubach won his second second uh, Super Bowl. They beat the Denver Broncos. 19, uh, 19, uh, that was 1978. 19, yeah, was that? Yeah, 78. 78. Yeah, I was just, just a couple years before I, before I came to Dallas, three years. So I was, you know, just in college, just out of high school in college. In uh, '78, I'm trying to think, and then uh, probably the 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 thing that uh, I'm proudest of has nothing to do with sports, 
but I, because of my relationships with all of these things, um, I, I met some, some people that had been involved in sports, much like Roger Staubach, had been involved with the military as well as sports. And I was asked to go to Normandy on the 70th anniversary of D-Day and put together a, 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 a video with two dozen World War II vets and was on a boat, I mean, on a bus for two weeks. And we went to Germany, Luxembourg, uh, Belgium, and back to France. And I said, can I take my son with me? Because he could shoot the whole thing. And they said, of course, Scott. So we did that, interviewed these guys. They got all very teary-eyed as we went, where the greatest generation, where they were in World War II. And my son and I both won an Emmy for the documentary we put together. And because of that, we were asked to come to, uh, to Pearl Harbor on the, on the 75th. So, I mean, it just, that those, those things are, those are the, you know, but they're all in some way, shape or form, even those guys, there were guys that were so involved with sports and knew a Roger Staubach, and that was a hero of this one and of that one. And it's just uh, how sports and leadership and in, 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 in military and how they've all come together is, is very, very cool. And it to really have been a is. Part of, is it's very, a big part of our lives. Um, yeah. And especially in this country, I mean, sports is, um, you know, really is the bedrock of every community. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the friendly, friendly rivalry between, you know, we got yeah. Kansas City and Philadelphia. It's, it's yeah. going to be fun. Um, well, look, Scott, I really appreciate you taking the time. Someday we're going to go over the Scott Murray top 10. Um, <laughs> but um, so 7-Eleven, right? 7 p.m. Central Time on February 11th. Yes, sir. Uh, airing on Fox. It's called The Perfect 10. Yes, sir. All That's right. It. That's it. So, And then after the Super Bowl, I want to get with you and let's talk about uh, what became of it. Would love to. Would love to. Look forward to it. Anything you need. And, and uh, thanks for all you do for, for Y Texas and those companies that are coming to the great state that we all call home. So, uh, so or at least those of us that live here in Texas. So uh, thank you. I appreciate your, uh, your time today and certainly your great friendship, Ed. Thanks so much. Likewise, Scott.